Hi, welcome to the third video in the Mixed Models series. So in this video, I'm going to build off the, the last presentation where I talked about the two-stage random effects formulation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that to simulate some data. And then I'm going to run models on the simulated data. So this really helped me kind of wrap my head around what mixed models were doing because you know the truth. So you make up fake data, you know the truth, and then you run the model and you see where your numbers come out. So um, hopefully you'll find it useful too. Also, I'm going to be using simulations to examine some of these issues in the future um, with different modeling strategies. So uh, this is my way of introducing basically the setup for those simulations. So the basic ideas that I hope you take away from this video are to further understand this random effect structure. So I'm going to keep showing it to you and we're going to be using it slightly different ways. So even if it didn't totally sink in in the last video, hopefully it will now. And I should add, if you haven't watched all the videos in this series, you should go back and start from the beginning. Um, if I remember, I'll put a link to the, um, the playlist up here because they do build off of each other. Okay, so right, so now we're going to focus on simulation of data using that two-stage random effects formulation, and then we're going to run the LMER, the mixed model, on our simulated data, and we're going to compare the simulation settings to the output. And then, since it was easy to add this to the, the models, I'm going to show what happens if we omit a random effect and how your type 1 error can be inflated, uh, specifically because the degrees of freedom will be mis misspecified. Okay, please do check out, there's an R Markdown HTML that accompanies this lecture. I'm going to give a link in the description box that'll take you to a Dropbox folder. The best way to view the HTML is to download it and then just open it on your local computer. And the R Markdown's there too if you want to run it, but with a lot of these R Markdown files, this one's not too long, but uh, some of them where I do run a lot of simulations, they can take a very long time, uh, many hours to compile. So um, do that. Uh, maybe I'll get things up in GitHub eventually in a nicer format. Okay, so time to uh, bring back some memories from the last video. So this is the all-in-one mixed model that we showed last time. So we were looking at reaction time, if you recall, and this was a design matrix. This is another design matrix. These are the random effects. Um, which describe the between subject variance and covariance, which is within this G matrix. In this specific case, we're looking at the sleep study data. So there's a random slope and a random intercept. And this matrix G also allows there to be a correlation between the slope and the intercept. And then we also have uh, epsilon I, which is the within subject variability. And uh, this is a vector. So the uh, variance is also a matrix. It's just sigma squared times an identity matrix of the size ni, where ni is the number of observations for the ith subjects. Quick reminder, anything with a, sub with a subscript of i is subject sp specific. So yi is the ith subjects. In this case, it would be reaction times. xi would be their design matrix. zi, also their design matrix. bi, specific to the ith subjects, um, pertaining to the random slope and intercept, but again, it's describing the distribution. Um, and since there isn't an I on sigma, LMER is assuming the within subject variance is the same across all subjects. So all of this mirrors assumptions of LMER. But the number of observations per subject can vary, although they do not in the sleep study data, which we looked at a little bit last time. So we can separate the levels, so this is the two-stage random effects formulation. Um, this is the first level, so this is analogous to um, looking at the analysis of each subject's reaction time as a function of, or and just getting their slope and intercept. Here this is combining each subject's slope and intercept to get group parameters beta. Okay, and when analyzing data, we work our way from the top down. So first, or we think about it from the top down, we get the subject specific beta i as first, and then we combine them to get the betas. For simulating data, we're gonna start at the bottom. AI is almost, again, it's always gonna be the identity until we get to more complicated models. 
And that's simply because we're only looking at um, group means for the beginning. So that's simplified. So what this is t telling us is how we can generate the subject-specific slopes and intercepts. So that's the first step. Simulate the beta i's, the slope and the intercept. So this vector beta i has those two parameters in it using a Gaussian distribution with a mean of ai beta and a variance covariance of g, which would look like this. Um, so this is the true intercept, the true slope, and then g is a two by two matrix that will describe the between subject variance in the intercept, the between subject variance in the slope, and the relationship between the two, the covariance. So using this, I simply ran, take, I forget how many draws, 16 random draws from this distribution, and we'll go through the specific values that I use for beta naught, beta one, and g when we look over the code. And that basic idea is we're gonna get a true line for each subject. So that's what the first step does. We use that second stage formulation to generate a true line for each subject. Again, reminder, I'm simulating data. Simulating data uh, is separate from analyzing real data. So this is used as a tool for understanding and in some cases we use data simulation for power analysis. I'm using it here as a learning tool because we're gonna know all the actual numbers and then we can match those up with the model fit later on. Okay. So step one is to get the truth for each subject. For step two, we're basically gonna use the first line here to generate wiggle around those lines. So now I'm gonna simulate the yi's using the lines we already have. So the beta i is effectively the line that we already have for each subject. And I'm gonna to add to that Gaussian noise with a variance of sigma squared. And then you get these data points here. So hopefully that makes sense. Step one, get the true lines. Step two, add a little noise to get the actual fake data. And then we can just throw these data into LMER and compare the parameter estimates that we get there with our simulation settings. So here's the code. Again, go to the description box if you want to download the markdown, which I uh, distributed in HTML because it looks nicer and it's easier to copy and paste the code directly. The R, R Markdown file itself is also in that directory. Look for the files starting with uh, video three or something like that. It starts with a three because uh, I'll pair up the different code files with the videos according to the number. Okay, so this function is for making fake data. Uh, much like the real data, I'm gonna assume time goes from zero to nine for each subject. Dependent variable is just gonna be a vector that I'm gonna fill in in the loop. Time vector, just repeating that time vector for each subject, so n sub is the number of subjects, which is something I can control in my R function. And then I'm just making a vector for the subject IDs. All right, here is my G matrix. So this is, all of this is step one. So I'm using that second uh, level of the two-stage formulation to generate the true beta i's for each subject. So this first part is that G matrix that I showed you earlier. So I'm assuming they're not correlated, so um, the, off, the off diagonals are zero, but this 24 squared, that corresponds to the within subject, I'm sorry, the between subject variance of the intercept, and then 10 squared is the between subject variance of the slope. And I just chose these numbers. I chose them roughly similar to the actual data estimates, but, um, it doesn't really matter. You can change these and rerun it if you want. But let's remember these numbers and we're gonna tr try to find them in the model output later. Okay, now here are the true betas. So here are the values that go into this beta vector or our means. So we're gonna have a true intercept of 251 and a true slope of 10. So all we do is we then use the multivariate normal distribution function in R, this is part of the mass library, to randomly generate data with the mean equal to this beta vector and the covariance equal to G. And then all I do is I separate those into a vector of slopes and a vector of intercepts. So intercepts and slopes. The second step, we're now gonna add that wiggle. So all I need to do 
is add some Gaussian noise to the lines we already have. So here's my sigma value. Remember this. This will be the um, uh, standard deviation. Or the variance will be this value squared um, for the within subject variance. So then you can see here what I'm doing is I'm taking the intercept for subject i plus time times their slope. So this is effectively their line. And I'm adding to that Gaussian noise using the R norm function, a vector of length time. So this will always be 10 with the standard deviation equal to sigma. And then I concatenate the data and then put them into a data frame and spit it out of the function. So here is the mixed model. Um, I'll go over this formulation more later, but um, basic, just quick rule of thumb. If you have any between subject variables, uh, so first off, everything here is a fixed effect. Everything in the parentheses, that's where you're specifying your random effect structure. To the right of the up and down slash is your grouping variable. And we're starting very simple with just random subject. And then these are the things that are random. I have a random slope, time, and a random intercept, which is indicated by one. A general rule of thumb, if you have any within subject variables that are continuous, so they have to be continuous, then they should be in here for starters. Um, and then you'll probably have a dozen convergence errors and then you can work backwards, but we'll get there. Uh, this model will work. So since time is a within subject variable, an example of a between subject variable would be gender or group. And that would not go in here because it's between subject. But anything that differs within subject should be in both places. Okay, so this is just looking at reaction time, how it relates to days, which is time all, and then my random effect structure. So let's go down to the output. And this first part, I put the orange box over under random effects. This is going to contain, contain all the information about our within subject variances, our between subject variance, and um, any correlations. So this is the between subject variance of the standard deviation, which we set to 24, the estimate is to 26. Uh, that's pretty good. The between subjects, so the wiggle around the slopes, we set that to 10, and that's 9. Uh, there's also this negative 0.33, this correlation, that was actually set to 0. So definitely going to talk about that more later. We're not going to worry about it now, uh, but we'll talk about simplifying the random effect structure. Last, the within subject variance here is estimated at 28.423, and we set that to 30. Just going to flip back really quickly to show you again where the 24, 10, and 30 came from. 30 between subject variance, and then 24 between subject variance for the intercept, 10 between subject variance for the slope. Okay, so that's that. And then we have the actual estimates. And in, in, in real life, once you get your random effects set up and stable and converging, everything's fine, uh, often you're done with the random effects section and what you want to do is focus on the fixed effects section. So here we can see we got an intercept of 253, the truth is 251, and a slope of 16.5 and the truth is 10. Um, again, this isn't done for the purposes of power or anything like that. It's just an illustration so you can match up the numbers and to help build your intuition about the output of LMER for this very simple model. And then later on, uh, in the second series of videos uh, for mixed models, when we start looking at different random effect structures, it'll become easier to extrapolate to the more complicated models. Now, notably, the degrees of freedom are 15. So I'll give you a little intuition for degrees of freedom and always report degrees of freedom and always um, if you're reading a manuscript that somebody wrote and they didn't report degrees of freedom, they need to because it's one of the quickest ways to kind of check if um, possibly they didn't run a mixed model correctly. So where does 15 come from? Well, if you think about what we did, how many subjects did we have? Well, we had 16. What within the two-stage formulation um, setup does the intercept here represent? Well, hand wavy, roughly what it is, is we took each of the 16 intercepts for each subject and we calculated the mean across those intercepts. So well, what are the degrees of freedom for a mean with 16 observation? 
15. Likewise for the slope. We had 16 slopes. We averaged the slopes. What are the degrees of freedom? Roughly 15. Will it always come out this nicely? No, that's not exactly how the degrees of freedom are calculated, but it should be ballpark 15. Depending on the, the, the way the noise structure is in the data, sometimes the degrees of freedom will be really large and it might be closer to the number of observations, but it gives you a feel for um, if they report the degrees of freedom and they're super high, let's say there's 60 subjects and they report the degrees of freedom and they're in the thousands, um, then you might ask them if they um, did properly set up the random effect structure. So, and I'll show you how they change if it's not correctly set up. I'm going to remove time from the random effects. So now time is no longer, the model doesn't know that they're repeated measures uh, when it's calculating that time slope. So it's really calculating across everything. So the estimate changes a bit. It went, no, it doesn't change, sorry. It's still 16.594. But now the degrees of freedom are 143, and you can see the degrees of freedom for the intercept did go up as well, and the intercept is actually fine, but this is really high. Um, and it's closer to the total number of observations, which is uh, 160. There's 10 observations per subject and 16 subjects. And so now the p-value is much, much smaller, and the t-statistic is much larger than it should be because the degrees of freedom are wrong. So. Um, don't forget your random effects. And I'll talk more about, you know, why you should start with the saturated uh, model and ways to simplify uh, the random effect structure when you must. Okay, so again, the idea here is just to help you wrap your head around what the mixed model is doing. Hopefully this helps you look at those numbers in the mixed model output and you can kind of picture in your head like, oh, that's what this is representing and that's what this other number represents. Um, again, the goal is to have a saturated random effect structure and I did cover this a little bit in another video. Um, oftentimes I will start with the saturated random effect structure and I get a gazillion uh, convergence errors that I then have to fix. So again, later on we'll talk about that. So for the next time, we're going to build off of these simulations a little bit more. And um, actually, for the very next video, we're going to talk more about the two-stage uh, model and, and using that to actually estimate models. But, so stay tuned for that. Otherwise, if you have questions, the best place to post them is the Mumford Brains Cats Facebook group. Um, also, you can ask me questions on Twitter. It's mumbrainstats. Adding comments to the videos sometimes works, but they're not very good at emailing me when I do get those. So that's it, and I hope you have a really great day. Thanks for watching.